night before he was crucified, Jesus prayed here in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus said, Father, not my will, but yours be done. And so he gave us one of many examples of the prayer life he enjoyed with his heavenly Father. For instance, in John's Gospel, we find Jesus offering a prayer of intercession. And we'll learn more about this prayer when our flight over the book of John gets to chapter 17. Now, let's get a profile of the Apostle John, a man who learned to live very close to the heart of Jesus. Jesus nicknamed John and his brother James as the Sons of Thunder. John also was known as the disciple Jesus loved. He wrote five New Testament books, and his purpose is clear, that we may believe in Jesus Christ. You may remember that Solomon, when he built the temple, asked God a very important question. He said, but will God indeed dwell with men? For behold, even heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you, much less this temple which I have built. At the same time, we know that God was pleased to dwell with people in a tabernacle and later on a temple. The Bible declares he dwelt between the cherubim on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. So there was a certain presence of God. There was a certain glory of God. But the prophet Ezekiel was there when chapters 9 through 11 of that book shows the glory of God departing from the temple, moving toward the Mount of Olives and leaving the city of Jerusalem. The glory left. Now we come to the New Testament. And in the Gospel of John, in chapter 1, verse 14, we read, And the Word became flesh and dwelt, tabernacled, pitched a tent among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so tonight we're dealing with this book that reveals this one who gloriously dwelt upon the earth. Now, we have the fourth of the four Gospels. And it's probably better, instead of seeing them as four different Gospels, see them as a four-fold Gospel. And as I mentioned last week, you might want to think of it as either a musical director with a string quartet, each one having them play a different instrument, or a movie director with a four-camera shoot, and each of the camera is going to, uh, cameras is going to emphasize something different in the scene, but is all telling the same story. A fourfold portrait of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to throw something in and I want to tie together some threads. Do you remember back in Numbers chapter 2? Stretch way back there. Numbers chapter 2, the children of Israel were to encamp around the tabernacle. Remember that? And there were four sides of the tabernacle, north, south, east, and west. The 12 tribes broke into three groups or four groups of three, and they were all on all sides of the tabernacle under one tribe's banner. And that one tribe had a banner with an emblem on it. So facing the east, there were tr three tribes that all pitched their tents and gathered under the tribe of Judah, which had the emblem of a lion. On the west side, there were three tribes that were under the banner of Ephraim. And Ephraim had the emblem of an ox. On the south side, there were three groups that were under the banner of Reuben. And Reuben, he had the symbol of a man. And then on the north, there were three more tribes. And they were under the tribe of Dan, which had the symbol of an eagle. So you have a lion, an ox, a man, and an eagle. We get to Hebrews and we discover that the tabernacle on earth was a model of the throne in heaven. So we're not surprised when we move forward from Numbers chapter 2 to Ezekiel chapter 1 and chapter 10 and we see these four angelic beings. And it says, each had the face of a man, a lion, an ox, and an eagle. And then we skip forward to Revelation chapter 4. And there were four living creatures, one with the face of a lion, another with the face of a calf or an ox, another with the face of a man, and the other with the face of an eagle. And these four Gospels, like the camps of Israel, and like the cherubim in heaven in Ezekiel and in Revelation, tell a story. 
They show Jesus as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Matthew's gospel is all about what Jesus said and how he fulfilled Jewish scripture. The Gospel of Mark is a fast-paced story. It emphasizes what Jesus did. It shows him as the ox, the beast of burden, the servant. And the ox was the servant animal. The Gospel of Luke will emphasize what Jesus felt. He's the quintessential man. The son of man is the underlying phrase throughout that book. And then we come now to the Gospel of John, which is the eagle. It shows Jesus in his deity as God the Son or the Son of God. In fact, F.B. Meyer even said, The Gospel of John is the gospel of the divine life of Jesus. The eagle has always been its recognized emblem. I want you to think of it this way. The first three Gospels are called what? Synoptics. The Gospel of John is a bit different, as, as we'll see, even in brief, flying over it. Those first three are like three snapshots of Jesus' life. John is like a studied portrait of the life of Jesus. Very different. In fact, over 90% of the material in the Gospel of John is unique to John and not found in any of the other Gospels. For example, the strongest evidence for the deity of Jesus Christ, if you want to show somebody that Jesus said he was God or others said he was God, you'll find it in the Gospel of John. The seven great I am statements are found in the Gospel of John. Also, in this Gospel, there are no parables. None, like you find in the other Gospels. You find, however, seven miracles, all that point you to believing that Jesus is the Son of God. Five of those seven miracles are found nowhere else except in this Gospel. You find in the Gospel of John the longest prayer in the New Testament. John chapter 17, Jesus prays the longest prayer of his recorded life as well as any prayer recorded in the New Testament. At the same time, you find the shortest verse in the Bible. In chapter 11, verse 35, Jesus wept. Shortest verse. One-third of the entire Gospel of John deals with the last eight days from Palm Sunday to Resurrection Sunday. So there's an emphasis on that in this book. And, last but not least, the most famous verse of all the Bible and most often quoted, which is John 3.16, of course, is found in this book. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Something else about this gospel. There's a name and a title. The name Jesus and the title Christ is found about 170 times in John's gospel. Jesus and Christ, 170 times. The word believe is repeated over and over and over again about 100 times. So you have Jesus and Christ, 170, believe 100 times. You're getting the theme of the book. John wants you and I to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. We'll get to that toward the end of the book. Now, something about John. John was a fisherman. His dad was Zebedee. His brother was James. They worked up in the Sea of Galilee. In fact, they had a fishing business, James, John, and Zebedee, in partnership with Andrew and Peter. And they were out on the Sea of Galilee day after day catching fish. Now, John's name is not in the Gospel of John. You'll never find it anywhere. I say, well, and how do you know he wrote it? Because the Apostle John discipled a guy by the name of Polycarp, and Polycarp discipled a guy by the name of Irenaeus, and we have Irenaeus' writings who learned from Polycarp that John is the author of this Gospel. So we have sources from pretty far back that attest to this. But his name isn't written. He leaves his name out. In fact, I love what he calls himself, the apostle whom Jesus loved. I like that. It's like, yeah, there's Peter and the other guys, but I'm the guy Jesus loved. (laughs) But I like that a lot because Jesus did love him. Of course, Jesus loved everyone, but he felt that special connection 
with Jesus Christ. Something else about John. He was part of the inner circle, wasn't he? Peter, James, and John. We find those three a little bit closer, sort of like the executive staff with Jesus Christ. They were there when Jairus' daughter was healed, the uh, synagogue ruler. Um, Peter, James, and John were there on the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus was transfigured before them with Moses and Elijah. In the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus is going through the greatest trial of his life, he takes Peter, James, and John aside and he says, watch with me and pray with me. Of course, they nod off these three great men of the inner circle of Jesus Christ. But John, uniquely, was at the cross when Jesus died. In fact, John was given charge of Jesus' mother, Mary, when Jesus said, woman, behold your son, son, behold your mother. John also, along with Peter, were the first ones at the tomb when they heard that the tomb was empty. Remember, John tells a story and he says, and the one did outrun Peter. That is John saying, I beat Peter in this little foot race to the tomb. By the way, John was the first to believe that Jesus Christ was risen from the dead. So let's get into it. John chapter 1, verse 1. Let me say before we jump in, John is the most theological of all the gospel writers. There's just several parts of this book that have some very deep theology, and it's seen in his prologue. Now, this is the other genealogy of Jesus Christ. Remember I said that last week. You see, Matthew begins his genealogy with Abraham because he's writing for the Jewish community. Luke begins his genealogy with Adam because he's the first man, and he's going to talk about the man, the son of man. But John goes all the way back to the beginning, to the pre-incarnate state where Jesus was with the Father in eternity. Verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Now that sounds very similar to Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And here, in the beginning was the Word. Now, it sort of sounds like a strange way to introduce a person in such an impersonal manner. In the beginning was the Word. You go, what's up with that? Well, this introduction or this term, the Word, logos, was a common first century concept. First of all, in the Jewish community, there were some Jewish writings, targums, commentaries, that referred to God by the term memra, which means the word. It was a substitutionary title for the person of God to call him the word. To translate that in Greek, it would be the logos. Number two, among the Greek community, this was a common term, especially the philosophical community. You see, the Greeks would look around their universe and they said, you know, we notice that there's order in the universe and there's predictable patterns and seasons. We notice that the sun rises and sets, so to speak, and we notice that there's four seasons that come and go in predictable, prescribed patterns. And then they would ask, why is that? And the answer the philosophers would give is because there is a logos, there is an ordering principle, a great uncaused cause that they called the Logos. So he goes all the way back using that term in the beginning was the word, the Logos. And the word was with God and the word was God. Now I'll never forget one afternoon. No, it was one morning. It was one morning because I was studying. I got a knock on my door. It was a few years back. I looked outside and I said, oh, I know exactly who's at my door. It was two Jehovah Witnesses. So I opened the door, and I knew the drill, because I knew where they were going to go with this. And so we started talking, and I'm nodding my head, and so they went right to the Gospel of John chapter 1. They said, well, you know, it says in John's Gospel, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. That's what it says in the original Greek. I said, are you sure about that? I said, oh, yes, we know that for sure. And so I asked the older mentor guy, you sure about that? He said, yes. I said, okay, hold on a minute. I had been studying Greek. So I went into my study, took out my Greek New Testament, opened it up, and showed it to the guy and said, 
read that and show that to me. He said, I can't read that. I said, well, let me tell you what it is then. Notice the first two verses. N-R-K, ain halagas, kai halagas, ain prastan theon, kai theos, ain halagas. <laughs> now, before I could say anything, I said, you'll notice that the term theos lacks a definite article. Do you know why that is? Of course, they're just looking at me like, a no. <laughs> I said, there's two reasons. Number one, in Greek, the predicate is put before um, at the beginning of the subject, whereas in English, we have it after the subject. The predicate is last, but in Greek, it's first because it's for emphasis sake. And whenever it lacks a definite article, it is showing character, essence, or nature. So this literally says, and the word to his essential character and nature was God. It's put there for emphasis. So when you say, it says a God, know that it doesn't say that. So I'm looking at both of them. And they're looking at one another. And the younger one who's being mentored by the older one, I was just hoping we could reel them in and be able to share with them. And the older guy says, okay, well, thank you very much. And slammed the door as fast as he could and decided we're never coming back there again. Folks, this is all I want to say about that. John is underscoring and emphasizing through the whole book that Jesus Christ is himself very God. It's in the language. It's unmistakable. Even the enemies of Jesus had more sense than a Jehovah Witness because they said, you being a man are constantly making yourself God. They knew what he was saying. And even in the very beginning, showing the ordering principle, the logos, the memra, was indeed very God. All things, verse 3, were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. Verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You have the creator, and at the same time in verse 14, the incarnation. He's God, but he's also man. Now something about John's writings, I want you to just remember both his gospel and his epistles, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. When John wrote all of his works, there was a prevailing ideology sweeping the early church. And you know, every era of the church has its winds of false doctrine. There's plenty of them around today, i.e. the emergent church. Every few years, there's new ideologies and beliefs. In John's day, it was a belief called Gnosticism that says Jesus Christ really wasn't a man. He wasn't in flesh. He just appeared to look like a man. And John will write in 1 John, whoever denies that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. So he's constantly keeping the audience that he writes to in mind. Now listen to how he writes 1 John, the beginning of that book. 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. That which was from the beginning, very similar, isn't it? which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. Can you imagine what it was like to have been John or Peter or any of the apostles being with Jesus and coming to the awareness of who it is they're walking with, who it is they're seeing, who it is they're hearing in these parables and stories and seeing Jesus touch people and heal them and seeing him weep We're seeing God weep. We're seeing God and hearing God speak. Here's God's reaction. We beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. Now let me give you a little short, if I can, outline of the Gospel of John. We've already started, but I'm going to give it to you. There's seven sweeping segments. Oh, it sounds like a preacher wrote that. Sweeping segments of the Gospel of John. First of all, The incarnation, and I'll give them all to you in terms of where they start and stop. The incarnation. Number two, the presentation. So it's the incarnation of the Son of God. Then the presentation of the Son of God. Then the three, the confrontation with the Son of God. And then four, the instruction of the Son of God. That's for his apostles only. Number five, the intercession of the Son of God. Number six, the execution of the Son of God, and number seven, the resurrection, or you might say the glorification 
of the Son of God. Those are the seven things that John mentions and sweeps through in this book. Um, Chapter 1, verse 19 through chapter 4 is the second section. This is the presentation of the Son of God. He presents himself to John the Baptist. He presents himself to the early disciples. He presents himself at Cana of Galilee through a miracle. He presents himself to Nicodemus in Jerusalem. He presents himself then to a Samaritan woman in chapter 4. Chapter 1, verse 29. The next day John saw him coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Something about John the Baptist. John the Baptist was a PK, I mentioned last time, a priest kid. And this PK was familiar with the temple. He was familiar with the sacrifices. He was familiar that every morning and every evening, lambs were brought and killed and blood was spilt to atone for the sins of the nation. So John now realizes who this one is. This is the atoning sacrifice The Lamb of God who takes away the sins, not of just a small people group in the Middle East, but the world. This grand sweeping realization of who Jesus is. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. Now what I'm going to do tonight... And it's not hard to do, since 90% of John is unique to this gospel only, is show you things that are really just mentioned in the gospel of John, but in each of these seven segments. Now, something helpful with this gospel. Were it not for the gospel of John, we wouldn't know the chronology of the life of Jesus. If you were to just take Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you might assume that the ministry of Jesus lasted only one year. Because most of them have a huge chunk of Jesus' ministry in Galilee. Because they were all from Galilee. Or at least they interviewed people that were Galilean. But John shows us the feasts and announces the feasts that Jesus appeared in Judea for at Jerusalem in the temple or back up in Galilee. All the feasts are mentioned and you can protract it out starting with about 29 A.D., all the way to 33 A.D., and you can, you can see that there was a three-and-a-half-year ministry of Jesus. That chronology comes from the Gospel of John. In fact, John alone tells us that Jesus cleansed the temple. Remember the cleansing of the temple when he overthrew the tables and took whips, and, and the other Gospels show that he did that at the end of his ministry? John also does, but shows us that he also did it at the beginning of his ministry. So he did it twice. We wouldn't get that unless we got the Gospel of John. And then look at chapter 2, verse 23. When he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. I'm taking you here to show you a contrast that John gives you. Here's a group of people. The only reason they're believing, quote, unquote, in Jesus is they want a miracle. They want a sign. But Jesus did not commit himself to them. Because he knew all men. And he had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. There was a man, this is in contrast to that group, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. What John is doing is this. He's saying, here's a crowd, a whole bunch of people that only were after Jesus for the fireworks, the miracles, the signs, the wonders. They want their daily miracle. In contrast to them, there was a a real seeker by the name of Nicodemus. He came to Jesus by night. See, Jesus knew all men. Again, Jesus is being portrayed as omniscient, knowing all things and knowing all men. So if somebody came up to him and said, hey, Jesus, I have a question, he would know who you are and why you're asking the question. John portrays this characteristic of our Christ. So here's Nicodemus. He comes to Jesus, but he comes with a misunderstanding. He's genuinely seeking, and here's his misunderstanding. We know that you're a teacher come from God. 
That's a misunderstanding. He's more than a teacher come from God. He's God come to teach. There's been a lot of teachers come from God. Moses was a teacher come from God. Isaiah was a teacher come from God. Martin Luther believed God called him as all preachers of the gospel, Augustine, etc. But Jesus Christ was the only begotten of the Father. He was the Son of God or God the Son who had come to teach. There's something else about Nicodemus before we move on. I feel sorry for the guy. Everybody gets down on Nicodemus for coming at night. And and they they make up this whole story. He must have been a coward. He had no guts. Because if he he really, you know, didn't mind seeing Jesus, he'd come anytime. Listen, everybody's busy, and he probably wants uninterrupted time because Jesus had an agenda all day long. So, So he could get FaceTime with Jesus and ask him questions and hear his heart. He came at night after his duties in the Sanhedrin were done and after Jesus' agenda was done. It was simply a way to get alone with Christ. Christ. So be careful that you don't come too heavy down on poor old Nicky here for this. Verse 3, Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, this is particular to the gospel of John, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Here's what I love. It's as if Jesus ignores the opening statement, flattering statement by John the Baptist. You know, Jesus, we know that you're a teacher. Come from God, for nobody can do these signs unless God is with him. Jesus just goes right for the heart of the matter, negates that whole statement, not like, well, thank you very much. I'm glad that you noticed. You know, there's a lot of people that notice. He didn't even go there. He goes right for the heart and tells Nicodemus how to get to heaven, how to enter the kingdom of heaven. Unless a man is born again, he will not see the kingdom of God. Now, unfortunately, the term born again has become a cliche. The world has stolen that cliche, used it, abused it, and then they've tried to give it back to us with their definition of it. Wrong. Anytime people use the word, feel free to correct them on what it means. It's not a sect of Christianity. Yeah, you got the Catholics and the Methodists and the Presbyterians, and you got the born againers over there. Like we're some subset of Christianity. There's no such thing as a Christian who's not born again. You have to be born again, Jesus said, to even get to heaven. And Christians are those who go to heaven. Christians are those who are born again. And born again people are believers or Christians. The word born again literally means from above. Genethe anothen is the Greek. To be begotten from above. It's a spiritual awakening or birth as opposed to just physical birth. And that conversation proceeds from this point on. But now down in verse 16, the most often quoted verse and most well-known verse. Martin Luther called it the Bible in miniature because it covers the whole scope of salvation. Verse 16. For God... Now, that's the origin of salvation. It comes from him. It's from God, for God. Have you ever had a person say, I'm searching for God? Actually, God isn't lost. You are. (laughs) God is searching for you. Because the Bible says we are dead in our trespasses and sins. At last I checked, dead people can't search for anything. You're incapable. It's for God. The origin is from God. Here's the motivation for salvation. So loved. Here's the object of salvation, the world. Here's the demonstration of salvation that he gave, his only begotten son. Here's the requirement of salvation, whoever believes in him. Now, I tell you what, Nicodemus wasn't used to this. He thought the way to get to heaven is by keeping rituals and ceremonies and going to the temple and doing all the things I've been taught as a young Jewish man and now a a priest, a teacher. No, you have to just believe in him. And the outcome or the conclusion of salvation is that you won't perish, but you'll have everlasting life. Now, John chapter 4 is a famous story. John is the only one to record it. It's Jesus going to Samaria. And it says in verse 4, but he needed to go through Samaria. You know, if you were Jewish and you read that 2,000 years ago, you wouldn't get verse 4. You would ask, Why does he need to go through Samaria? Nobody needs to go through Samaria. Nobody deals with Samaritans. 
In fact, though Samaria was the most direct route from north to south, it was up in the mountains. And because the Jews shunned the Samaritans, they would rather take two alternate routes across the other side of the Jordan River and then cross it up again up on top to stay away from Samaria or the coastal route once again to stay away from Samaria. And it was that bad. Now we won't read it, but in this story, when Jesus talks to this woman at the well of Samaria, she even remarks, how come you, a Jew, are asking me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. That begs the question, why? Here's why. Go all the way back to 722 B.C. You know these dates by now. The Assyrian Empire conquered the ten northern tribes of Israel, right? Including Samaria. They took the Jewish people away. They repopulated it with different pagan peoples from all over the world. After a period of time, they married each other and they married the Jews who were left over. So now you have different levels of breeds of people. It's not a pure Jewish situation. So when the people came back into the land to rebuild the temple, Ezra and Nehemiah, when the Samaritans wanted to help, they said, thank you, but no thank you. We're able to do it ourselves. They wanted to keep it pure. The Samaritans reacted against this. They started rebuilding their own temple in Samaria. There never really was a temple, but they built their own temple so that by the time of Jesus, there was now a temple in Jerusalem and in Mount Gerizim. So in this story, the woman says, our fathers say this mountain, Gerizim, is the place where one ought to worship. You Jews say Jerusalem. Remember Jesus said, you don't even know what you're worshiping. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. So they had brought pagan foreign gods and ideologies and mixed it with their worship of God and had a different place and a different system. And so there was animosity between the Jews and the Samaritans. But Jesus needed to go through Samaria. Why? Because he had a divine appointment with a woman who was dejected and cast off and had so many relationships. She was broken and beaten and he wanted to reach her and in reaching her, reach a whole village. And later on, many Samaritans in the book of Acts would come to Christ. Let's go to the third section of this gospel, chapters 5 through 12. This now is the confrontation with the Son of God. The confrontation with the Son of God. Okay? There are several things that happen, and John writes about them in this section to show how Jesus came head to head with the Jewish legal system, and it wasn't very pretty. They rejected him. So chapter 5, Jesus is in Jerusalem at the pool of Bethesda. We'll take a snapshot of that in a minute. And he heals a man, and it creates an uproar in Jerusalem. In chapter 6, Jesus is back up in Capernaum, and in the synagogue there, he gives a discourse on being the bread of life. And that creates a fervor and an animosity. Chapter 7 through 10, Jesus is back in Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles. And he gives several discourses that also alienate him from the Jewish hierarchy. Chapter 11, Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, an unmistakable sign that he is the Son of God. The Jewish leaders find out about it and say, we've got to kill this guy fast before everybody starts believing in him. And then in chapter 12 is the triumphal entry. And the people worship him as their Messiah. And again, a deeper animosity. And the public ministry of Jesus will close after this. Now let me just highlight this for you. In this section, and a little bit in the next, are those famous seven I am statements of Jesus. And here they are. Jesus in chapter 6, verse 35, said, I am the bread of life. Chapter 8, verse 12, and 9, verse 5, I am the light of the world. Chapter 10, verse 7, I am the door to the sheepfold. Chapter 10, verse 11, I am the good shepherd. Chapter 11, verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. Chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And chapter 15, verse 1 and 5, I am the true vine. Seven I am statements of what Jesus says about himself to his people. Now, chapter 5, verse 1, 
And there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bet Ezda, or Bethesda as we call it, having five porches. Bethesda means the house of mercy. But if you were to go there 2,000 years ago, you'd say this is the house of misery. Because there are sick people waiting to get healed, and there's so many of them. It's just like beds in a hospital filled with people, and nobody's getting better. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. I love this chapter. And I love teaching this chapter in Jerusalem at the pool of Bethesda, which is there today. Now, I'm smiling when I say that because years ago, critics would say, well, you know, the Bible has many things to say that just aren't true. For instance, the Pool of Bethesda. It says it's by the Sheep Gate. There is a Sheep Gate, and we found that, but we've dug all around Jerusalem, and we have not found this Pool of Bethesda, especially as described in the Gospel of John as having five porches. It sounds like it's a big pool. Well, several years ago, the archaeologists just kept digging. And guess what they found? The Pool of Bethesda. And you know what? They said, this thing's big. And they discover, and you can see remnants of it today, five colonnaded porches. Now, here's the picture of it. Picture you're in a helicopter looking down, and you see this huge triangle, four sides. And each four sides, there are a colonnaded porch. So you have one, two, three, four porches. And then a porch dividing the pool into two pools, and that's the fifth porch just exactly as the Bible says. And so then all the critics, all they could say was, oh, well, we'll find more discrepancies. Just give us time. They love to do this, and the spate of the archaeologist overturns them all the time. Jesus came there in that place of misery, that hopeless condition. You know, when I was a kid, my dad used to say, the Bible says God helps those who help themselves. I grew up believing that the Bible said that. Then I got saved. Then I read the Bible. And I never found it. So I read it in another translation. Never found it. I better try a more modern translation. Never found it. You know what I found? The theme of the Bible, one of the themes, God helps the hopeless and helpless, not those who help themselves. Here's a man who couldn't help himself. He had no strength. He was abandoned by society. The impotent man meets the omnipotent man in this chapter. And he is healed. And a testimony is left in Jerusalem. Go down to chapter 7. We'll skip over the bread of life discourses in chapter 6. Not enough time. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee. Notice this. For he did not want to walk in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. Now what John is showing is that the opportunity for Jesus is narrowing. He can't just publicly go anywhere because people are trying to put out his life. Now the feast... The Jews' Feast of Tabernacle was at hand. Something about the Feast of Tabernacle, so we can skip down to a very important verse. Every year, the people of Israel were commanded to go on their property somewhere or in town and build shelters, little lean-tos, booths. You could use willow trees or branches from any trees you want or any kind of temporary shelter. You and your family would leave your home and sleep and live out in that temporary booth for a whole week, seven days, once a year. And parents every year went, oh, we have to do that again. And every kid went, all right, we're going camping this week. They loved it. They loved it. It was a great family thing. And it was to commemorate that while their forefathers were in the desert for 40 years, God took care of them, fed them with manna from heaven and water out of the rock. So for seven days... In the temple, something was happening. The priests would have a procession. They took a golden pitcher, and they would walk down to the pool of Siloam in the lower city, fill it with water, take the golden pitcher up to the temple mount, and where the altar of sacrifice was, they'd pour water on the floor of the temple at the base of the altar. As they poured water, commemorating water coming out of the rock in the Old Testament, God taking care of them, the priests, the choir would sing, Isaiah chapter 12, here's the lyrics. For with joy you will draw waters from the wells of salvation. They did that every single day for seven days. After the seven days, 
there was one more added day called the eighth day of the feast or the last great day of the feast. And that takes us down to verse 37. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Okay, remember I said the eighth day is the last day of the feast? Because this is when they marched around the altar seven times, and two times they got water in the golden pitcher, pulled a siloam, dumped it out, dumped it out again. As they dumped it out, three trumpet blasts. The people would shout. The choir would sing, with joy you will draw water from the well of salvation. And I believe it was then, at that climactic moment, when they were celebrating water coming out of the rock, God satisfying the thirst of our fathers. Notice verse 37. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and what? He cried out. Don't picture Jesus in a temple saying, excuse me, I have something to say. He shouted because there was a huge crowd in the court of the Gentiles. If anyone is thirsty, whoa. They all looked. Let him come to me and drink. For as the scripture has said, out of his belly, innermost being, will flow rivers of living water. John says this, he spoke about the Holy Spirit who was not yet given. Jesus is pointing to himself as the one who quenches the thirst of that nation and of all mankind. An unmistakable proclamation. Go down to chapter 12. I want you to look at a key verse. Because John, throughout his narrative, is showing that the window of opportunity is closing. And here we see the close of Jesus' public ministry because of national unbelief. Chapter 12, verse 37. But although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him. That the word of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spoke. Lord, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore, they could not believe, because Isaiah said again, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they should see with their eyes, and lest they should understand with their hearts in turn, so that I should heal them. So that, that public ministry of Jesus essentially ends here at the end of chapter 12. Now chapters 13, 14, 15, and 16 is all private stuff. This now is the instruction of the Son of God, and it's only with his apostles. The scene is Passover. They're in an upper room. They're celebrating before Jesus' death the last meal together, what we call the Last Supper. No crowds. Wonderful, intimate meal. The disciples are there. Verse 1. Now, before the feast of Passover... When Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand and that he had come from God and was going to God. Don't you get this sense that John is portraying Jesus as absolutely in control He knows who he is, knows where he's come from. He's pre-incarnate. He's the word made flesh, God in human flesh. He knows the plan of God for the cross. He knows where he's going to be glorified. He knows it all. He rose from supper, verse 4. Laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself, or tied it around himself. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. This was a special night. Beginning here and lasting all the way to the end of chapter 16. Notice in your Bible, if you have a red letter edition, the letters are mostly red. This is Jesus talking. This is a time of intense discipleship. Jesus knows where he's going, and he knows he'll be leaving them soon. They don't know it. They're a little bit scared and shaken at this point. Because in chapter 14, he'll have to say, let not your hearts be troubled. Don't be afraid. You believe in God. Believe also in me. So this intimate discipleship before Jesus leaves, and he begins by washing their feet. Now, this is more than Jesus being a good example. This is more than just a nice, intimate little meal 
And Jesus is performing some wonderful, sweet thing that he wants them to practice every time they have a church service together, have a foot washing ceremony. That's not what this is about. What Jesus is doing, in essence, is acting out his entire ministry in parable form. Think about it. Go back to verse 4. He rose from supper. Now, he's already done this in a greater way when he came from heaven to this earth. He, he rose up to do the Father's bidding, coming from heaven, pouring himself out, and coming to the earth from a place of glory. Next, he laid aside his garments. Think of what Paul says in Philippians 2. Jesus, who was in the form of God, did not think it robbery to be equal with God, but he laid aside his garments, so to speak. He poured himself out. He emptied himself and became a man. Notice the next phrase. He took a towel and girded himself. He put it around him. And essentially, he has done this. He has wrapped his divinity in a cloak of humanity, God in human flesh. Notice the next phrase. He poured water into a basin to wash the disciples' feet. In a few hours, he will be pouring out his blood to wash the sins of all who will believe in him. Notice the last one. And dried them with his towel. Jesus started to wash the feet. He completed it by drying the disciples' feet. Whatever Jesus starts, he finishes. He completes. He who has begun a good work in you will continue to perform it, Paul said, Philippians 1, until the day of Christ. So think of it this way. Jesus cleans all the fishes he catches. He's caught you, and he's apprehended you, and he's saved you, and he's not going to leave you and say, oh, you're, you're sort of a hopeless case. I'm going to move on to the next person. He's committed to working in you and drying you with a towel. Chapter 17 is the fifth section of this book. This is the intercession of the Son of God. This whole chapter, all 632 words in red are Jesus' prayer to the Father. Now, here's why this is important. I wrote a whole book on this chapter called When God Prays. Jesus knew he had a limited amount of time to be on this earth. So, first of all, he got his disciples together and passed on some very important principles he wanted them to know for four chapters. Then he prays in chapter 17. And you might ask, when a person knows he's about to die and he's in contact with the Father, God the Father, what things were on Jesus' heart, what were the most important things in prioritizing his prayer life, knowing he was about to go to the cross? Because those are the very things Jesus prays for. The glory of God, the future of the disciples, the unity of the church, etc. Several things Jesus prays for, knowing that his time is limited. So this is the longest prayer. Jesus spoke these words. By the way, this is the real Lord's Prayer. You know, we say, say the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven. That's not the Lord's Prayer. That's the disciples' prayer. That's the prayer Jesus told the disciples to pray. This is the Lord's own prayer to his Father. This is the real Lord's Prayer. I read a story that John, Wa John Knox, who was the Scottish reformer, on his deathbed asked his wife, to read John 17 to him. And as he passed from earth into heaven, he listened to the words of Jesus' prayer. Very, very beautiful prayer. Jesus prayed it out loud, obviously, because John was able to hear it and write it down. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you. Now know something about Jesus. It's a long prayer the longest recorded prayer. This isn't the first time Jesus prayed. Altogether, in all four Gospels, 19 times the four Gospels point to the fact that Jesus prayed. One time, he spent all night in prayer to God. On another occasion, he got up very early before the day, and he prayed the day in before he chose his disciples. And there were several occasions that point to Jesus praying. Now, here's the point I'd like to make. I think it's pretty obvious. If Jesus Christ, who is God, but also in human flesh, he had two natures, right? He was 
theanthropic, theos and anthropos, God and man. But, but even still, if he felt the necessity to depend on the Father in prayer for so much of his earthly life, where does that leave us? How could we ever think, well, I'll just shoot up a quick one on the way to work? You see what I'm saying? I'm not trying to bring condemnation saying you've got to pray four hours every day. But would you agree that your prayer life is an area that could be enhanced? I think we all could say that. I say that. I want that. And I often think if Jesus Christ, who is theanthropic, depended on his Father that much, me, I'm only anthropic. Right? I'm just a man. You're just a man. You're just a, a woman or a man. We need to be depending on him all the time. Jesus lived a life of dependence upon his Father. Let's go to the next section, chapters 18 and 19. This is the execution of the Son of God. Chapter 18 and 19 includes these key events, the Garden of Gethsemane and the arrest, being taken to examination, examined before two high priests that year, Caiaphas and Annas, and then Pontius Pilate, the Roman procurator. Look at chapter 18, verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words... He went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron. John puts that in there. He wants you to know that when Jesus left, he crossed this brook. And I'll tell you why in a minute. Where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now, the Kidron Valley played a very important part in Jewish history. When King David was rejected by the nation of Israel... The Bible says in Samuel, he crossed over the Kidron Brook and went up the Mount of Olives, which is where the Garden of Gethsemane is located. So Jesus, rejected by the nation, crosses over the Kidron, the son of David, following the same thing, rejected by the nation. David was also betrayed by one of his sons, Absalom, fled over the Kidron. Also, one of David's trusted men, Ahithophel, later on committed suicide. Later on, Judas, the one who betrayed Jesus, will commit suicide. I think what John is showing is the parallel between the son of David and his ancestor, King David, rejected by the nation, crossing over that same part of land. Something else, because it was Passover, there was a drain from the temple on the temple mount where the lambs were slaughtered. There was a conduit where the blood and water that was washed went into this stone conduit and emptied out into the Kidron Brook. There was a a little river flowing 2,000 years ago. Which would mean when Jesus crossed over the Brook Kidron, there must have been a bridge to cross it, that the Brook Kidron was flowing with blood of lambs being sacrificed at Passover for the sins of the nation. And here is the significant part, the Lamb of God crossing over the area that is so visible A sign of atonement for the nation. Verse 4. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, this is now Jesus who's crossed over. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he says to the soldiers who come, whom are you seeking? And they answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Now, if you have a New King James, is he italicized in your Bible? Okay. When it's italicized, it means it's not in the original. We're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. I am. I am. In Greek, ego eimi. The Septuagint translation for the Old Testament, I am that I am. Who are you seeking? Jesus. I am. Notice what it says in the next verse. Now when he had said to them, I am, they drew back and fell to the ground. Whoa. Verse 10, then Simon Peter having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. Thank you, Peter. Very little. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? Listen, Peter was a good fisherman. He was not a good swordsman. He wasn't aiming for his ear. He was trying to cut off his head. And he missed. He's not like, watch this, I'm aim for the ear. He just was hacking. He's a great fisherman. Leave it at that, Peter. He cut off his ear. Now, here's what I think is happening. Peter's hurting inside, and Peter's reacting. 
inside Peter, at one time was this belief, because he said, Jesus, even though everybody else forsakes you, I'll never forsake you. Right? I'll follow you to death. So here's Peter trying to prove that he can do. I'm going to stand up and defend God. Well, how many times do we do that? We think we got to defend God. Give me a sword. Let me cut some people up because i got to defend God. Well, chapter goes on. He's arrested. He's brought to trial before the high priest, Annas Caiaphas, Pontius Pilate in verse 38, who has Jesus stand in front of him, says, I find no fault in him. And so in chapter 19, verse 1, Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. Keep in mind what that means. Scourge is to whip a person. A person was tied to a post in those days, a Roman pillar. His arms were around it, so his back was taut, like real, real stretched. The skin was stretched. The flagellum was a whip with a wooden handle, leather strips, pieces of glass, lead, and bone tied into it so that when the whip hit the back, it grabbed, and then it was pulled, and the flesh was lacerated. And some of the old accounts say a person would get lacerated into the deep subcutaneous tissue, and some Roman beatings were so bad that it would even expose the organs. This is the whipping that Jesus took. By his stripes we are healed. And the soldiers, verse 2, twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe, And they said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him with their hands. Soldiers would play a lot of different games with criminals. They were bored. Nobody wanted the duty of watching a criminal. And a Roman soldier who watched criminals was a very hardened individual. And one of the games they played was called the hot hand. They'd blindfold a a prisoner, and one of the soldiers would slug in the face. You know, when somebody slugs you in the face and you're in a fight, you can... You can watch and flow with it. When you're blindfolded, you can't adapt. It's a cold cock. And so the the criminal would be hit, and the soldiers would make the criminal guess which one of the soldiers point which direction of who hit him. And when he didn't get it right, they hit him harder and harder. These are the games they're playing with Jesus. Verse 25, there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, Mary Magdalene, When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. This is amazing to me. Something I know about suffering and watching people who suffer. When a person is suffering, either the loss by death or deep physical pain, suffering is very all-consuming. It's very absorbing. And people usually remark, about themselves and how I feel, and this is, this is the pain I'm experiencing. Seldom will a person in deep pain, when pain is that consuming, think about anybody else. They can't think about anything else. So for Jesus in that kind of state to be thinking about his mother's future is the act of great compassion. Now, we don't know for sure, but we do know, according to tradition, John took Mary home. The best tradition says that she lived another 11 years, died in Jerusalem at about age 59. That's the best tradition. Some traditions say it's called the Assumption of Mary, that she ascended up into heaven. Let me just say that's quite an assumption to make. There's no historical documentation of it. It's simply um, passed on by a a, a very poorly subscribed tradition. Now, verse 7 is the last part. It's the resurrection of the Son of God, chapter 20 and 21. You know about this. Let me take you down to... Chapter 20, verse 30, notice what it says. And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you might have life in his name. Chapter 21 is one of the coolest chapters. The disciples go to Galilee. Peter decides to go back to what he knows, fishing. Disciples follow suit. Jesus comes up, stands on the shore. They don't recognize him. Calls out, hey, children, uh, you have any fish, have any food? And they go, no. So he goes, hey, throw your net on the other side of the lake, which sort of sounded familiar to them, like three years before somebody else did that. Luke chapter 5, it happened to be Jesus when he called them to be fishers of men. As soon as they throw the net on the other side of the lake, the nets almost break. They catch 153, he says, fish 
in that net and bring the net in. The difference between fruitlessness and fruitfulness is that long. That's about how wide the boat. Okay, that, that, that wide. They're fishing on this side. They catch nothing. They throw their nets on this side. And because the service is now directed by Jesus, it's fruitful. They fished all night, caught nothing. Now Jesus just says, do it this way. Boom! Peter goes, that's got to be the Lord. Peter throws off his robe. He has nothing underneath. Text says that. And he jumps in the lake. Now, he plunges into the sea. He had removed his garment, plunged into the sea. And then the rest of this story pretty much is the reinstatement of Peter. Three times, Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, yes, Lord, I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Tend my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Feed my sheep. People say, why three times? Jesus was denied by Peter three times. Jesus gave Peter the opportunity three times to affirm his love for him. Peter, do you love me? Verse 15. Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said, feed my lambs. Notice that he he didn't say, Peter, do you obey me? Or Peter, do you believe in me? Or Peter, do you believe this doctrine? Jesus wanted to know one thing only that was more important than anything, and that's the relationship that we have. Do you love me? Because Jesus knows if you love him, faith works and everything else will follow. It'll all follow, the love that you have for him. What do you think he meant when he said, do you love me more than these? It could mean, do you love me more than these other apostles? He's sort of putting them on the spot if he did that. Because at one time he basically said, you know, I love you more than these other guys. They're all going to forsake you, but I'll die with you. Uh, Peter, do you really love me more than these? Ooh, well, um, I do love you. Or it could mean, Peter, do you love me more than these fish? Do you love me more than your own occupation, everything you've lived for, everything you've loved? Are you willing to leave this like you once did and become a fisher of men? Do you love me more than these We don't know. It could mean either. It could mean both. And Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved, that would be John, who leaned on his breast and who said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? And Jesus said, if I will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? Follow me. I'll take it down to verse 25 and we'll end. There are also many other things that Jesus did which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. Now that, that last statement could be exaggeration used as a literary device or could be literal. Because think of it. Think of all of the people that have ever been changed and touched, their own testimonies, their own fruit, their own experiences with Jesus Christ for the last 2,000 years around the world. Their books are still being written, and thousands and millions could be written that haven't been written. Jesus Christ is the Son of God, is God in human flesh, and still changes lives. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this fourth testimony, this studied portrait of the Son of God, who is God the Son. Lord, we think of our own lives, our own testimonies, how the Word made flesh has changed us and how we have come to believe and the peace that we have inside because of it, the priorities that are now in our life because of it. Lord, some of us maybe, just maybe, have gone back to our own form of fishing, our own occupation and said, well, I don't know if any of this Bible stuff is really all that true. So just in case it's not, I'm going to derive my satisfaction from this relationship or this experience or these people or this thing or this home or this endeavor. And maybe the Lord is saying, do you love me more than these? Are you willing to give up anything I ask you to give up and follow me and my will for your life? 
Because, Lord, you said that if we lose our life, we're going to find it. We thank you for the life that's in Christ. Thank you for the exciting book, the Gospel of John. And thank you, moreover, for the great work of the Holy Spirit done in every heart of those who love you tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.